This is a recording of Hard Times by Charles Dickens, Chapter 12, The Old Woman. Old Stephen descended the two white steps, shutting the black door with the brazen door plate by the aid of the brazen full stop, to which he gave a parting polish with the sleeve of his coat, observing that his hot hand clouded it. He crossed the street with his eyes bent above upon the ground, and thus was walking sorrowfully away, when he felt a touch upon his arm. It was not the touch he needed most at such a moment, the touch that would calm the wild waters of his soul, as the uplifted hand of the sublimest love and patience could abate the raging of the sea. Yet it was a woman's hand, too. It was an old woman, tall and shapely still, though withered by time, on whom his eyes fell when he stopped and turned. She was very cleanly and plainly dressed, had country mud upon her shoes, and was newly come from a journey. The flutter of her manner in the unwanted noise of the streets, the spare shawl carried unfolded on her arm, the heavy umbrella and little basket, the loose long-fingered gloves, to which her hands were unused, all bespoke of an old woman from the country in her plain holiday clothes, come into Coketown on an expedition of rare occurrence. Remarking this at a glance, with the quick observation of his class, Stephen Blackpool bent his attentive face, his face, which, like the faces of many of his order, by dint of long working with eyes and hands in the midst of a prodigious noise, had acquired the concentrated look with which we are familiar in the countenances of the deaf, the better to hear what she asked him. Pray, sir, said the old woman, didn't I see you come out of that gentleman's house? Pointing back to Mr. Bounderby's. I believe it was you, unless I have had the bad luck to mistake the person in following. Yes, missus, returned Stephen, it were me. Have you, you'll excuse an old woman's curiosity, have you seen the gentleman? Yes, missus. And how did he look, sir? Was he portly, bold, outspoken, and hearty? As she straightened her own figure and held up her head in adapting her actions to her words, the idea crossed Stephen that he had seen this old woman before and had not quite liked her. Oh, yes, he returned, observing her once attentively. He were all that. And healthy, said the old woman, as the fresh wind. Yes, returned Stephen. He were ettin and drinkin, as large and loud as a homobee. Thank you, said the old woman with infinite content. Thank you. He certainly never had seen this old woman before, yet there was a vague remembrance in his mind, as if he had more than once dreamed of some old woman like her. She walked along at his side, and, gently accommodating himself to her humor, he said Coketown was a busy place, was it not? To which she answered, Aye, sure. Dreadfully busy. Then he said, she came from the country, he saw, to which she answered in the affirmative. By parliamentary this morning, I came 40 mile by parliamentary this morning, and I'm going back the same 40 mile this afternoon. I walked nine mile to the station this morning, and if I find nobody on the road to give me a lift, I shall walk the nine back tonight. That's pretty well, sir, at my age, says the chatty old woman, her eye brightening with exultation. Deed tis. Don't do it too often, missus. No, no, once a year, she answered, shaking her head. I spend my savings so once every year. I come regular to tramp about the streets and see the gentlemen. Only to see em? returned Stephen. That's enough for me, she replied with great earnestness and interest of manner. I ask no more. I have been standing about on this side of the way to see that gentleman, turning her head back towards Mr. Bounderby's again, come out. But he's late this year, and I have not seen him. You came out instead. 
Now, if I am obliged to go back without a glimpse of him, I only want a glimpse. Well, I have seen you, and you have seen him, and I must make that do. Saying this, she looked at Stephen as if to fix his features in her mind, and her eye was not so bright, bright as it had been. With a large allowance for difference of taste, and with all submission to the patri to the patricians of Coketown, this seemed so extraordinary a source of interest to take so much trouble about that it perplexed him. But they were passing the church now, and as his eye caught the clock, he quickened his pace. He was going to his work, the old woman said, quickening hers too, quite easily. Yes, time was nearly out on his telling her where he worked. The old woman became a more singular old woman than before. Ain't you happy? She asked him. Why, there almost nobody but has their troubles, missus, he answered evasively, because the old woman appeared to take it for granted that he would be very happy indeed, and he had not the heart to disappoint her. He knew that there was trouble enough in the world. And if the old woman had lived so long and could count upon his having so little, why, so much the better for her and none the worse for him. Aye, aye, uh, you have your troubles at home, you mean, she said. Times just now and then, he answered slightly. But working under such a gentleman, they don't follow you to the factory? No, no, they didn't follow him there, said Stephen. All correct there. Everything accordant there, he did not go so far as to say, for her pleasure, that there was a sort of divine right there. But I have heard claims almost as magnificent of late years. They were now in the black by-road near the place, and the hands were crowding in. The bell was ringing, and the serpent was a serpent of many coils, and the elephant was getting ready. The strange old woman was delighted with the very bell. It was the beautifulest bell she had ever heard, she said, and sounded grand. She asked him when he stopped good-naturedly to shake hands with her before going in, how long he had worked there. A dozen year, he told her. I must kiss the hand, said she, that has worked in this fine factory for a dozen year. And she lifted it, though he would have prevented her, and put it to her lips. What harmony, besides her age and her simplicity, surrounded her, he did not know. But even in this fantastic action, there was a something neither out of time nor place, a something which it seemed as if nobody else could have made as serious or done with such a natural and touching air. He had been at his loom full half an hour thinking about this old woman, when, having occasion to move round the loom for its adjustment, he glanced through a window which was in his corner and saw her still looking up at the pile of building lost in admiration. Heedless of the smoke and mud and wet and of her two long journeys, she was gazing at it as if the heavy thrum that issued from its many stories were proud music to her. She was gone by and by, and the day went after her, and the light sprung up again, and the express whirled in full sight of the fairy palace over the arches near, little felt amid the jarring of the machinery, and scarcely heard above its crash and rattle. Long before then his thoughts had gone back to the dreary room above the little shop, and to the shameful figure heavy on the bed, but heavier on his heart. Machinery slackened, a throbbing feebly like a fainting pulse stopped. The bell again, the glare of light and heat dispelled. The factories, looming heavy in the black wet night, their tall chimneys rising up into the air like competing towers of Babel. He had spoken to Rachel only last night, it was true, and had walked with her a little way. But he had his new misfortune on him, in which no one else could give him a moment's relief, and for the sake of it, and because he knew himself to want that softening of his anger, which no voice but hers could affect, he felt he might so far disregard what she had said as to wait for her again. He waited, but she had eluded him. She was gone. On no other night in the year could he so ill have spared her patient face. 
Oh, better to have no home in which to lay his head than to have a home and dread to go to it through such a cause. He ate and drank, for he was exhausted, but he little knew or cared what, and he wandered about in the chill rain, thinking and thinking and brooding and brooding. No word of a new marriage had ever passed between them, but Rachel had taken great pity on him years ago, and to her alone he had opened his closed heart all this time on the subject of his miseries, and he knew very well that if he were free to ask her, she would take him. He thought of the home he might at the moment have been seeking with pleasure and pride, of the different man he might have been that night, of the lightness then in his now heavy-laden breast, of the then restored honor, self-respect, and tranquility all torn to pieces. He thought of the waste of the best part of his life, of the change it made in his character for the worse every day, of the dreadful nature of his existence, bound hand and foot to a dead woman and tormented by a demon in her shape. He thought of Rachel, how young when they were first brought together in these circumstances, how mature now, how soon to grow old. He thought of the number of girls and women she had seen marry, how many homes with children in them she had seen grow up around her, how she had contentedly pursued her own lone quiet path for him, and how he had sometimes seen a shade of melancholy on her blessed face that smote him with remorse and despair. He set the picture of her up beside the infamous image of last night and thought, could it be? that the whole earthly course of one so gentle, good, and self-denying was subjugate to such a wretch as that? Filled with these thoughts, so filled that he had an unwholesome sense of growing larger, of being placed in some new and diseased relation towards the objects among which he passed, of seeing the iris round every misty light turn red, he went home for shelter. <laughs>